Well, welcome everyone today to the launch of our new HKS Limitless series. In this presentation today, we will have HKS leaders and industry experts that will explore innovative ideas influencing design through the lens of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So today's session, we'll have leaders in the senior leading realm. We'll discuss balancing access in the rapidly expanding sector to share value um, of community partnership and the importance of flexibility for stakeholders in the senior living facility and design. So now I'll introduce our amazing moderator for today, HKS architect and design researcher, Erin Peavy. Thank you, Erin, take it away. Hello. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel with such uniquely special panelists. Um, really excited to share with you today. So the people that we have with us are our own Siobhan Farvadin. Um, we worked on me pronouncing her name. Sorry, Siobhan. Um, she is a principal and a senior living expert that has worked uh, with a number of these specialists throughout the years um, and an architect here at HKS. We also have Tim Sanders, a senior investment officer um, who is also a research and innovation diversity network sponsor at Ventas. Uh, we have Melissa Orth, the president and CEO at Legacy Senior Communities, and Janie Schultz. She's a former Dallas City Planning Commissioner for District 11 and a board chair for City Lab High School Foundation. And lastly, we have Grant Warner, who is a principal and senior living specialist and an architect here at HKS. So we're really excited to get to share with you um, our perspective on uh, how we think about the future of senior living and how we can think about it as more equitable, diverse and inclusive, and also how leaning into that lens can help us to make something that is more vibrant um, and embraces senior living as a part of the community overall. So first we're gonna start with a fireside chat with Siobhan and Tim. Um, so let's kick that off. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's such a huge honor and a, to participate and contribute towards this series. And I look forward to the sequels. A special thanks to the leadership at HKS, Giselle, and others who elevated this topic of equity and bringing the senior housing to the forefront. So out of this discussion, we're hoping to bring more awareness to our industry and we can look for opportunities to share ideas and cross-pollinate across sector. First off, I'd like to give a big shout out to L Lucas McCurdy, uh, co-host of Bridge the Gap podcast, a podcast dedicated to everything and everything senior living. A few months ago, uh, Lucas and I chatted and I told him about the series that we were launching. And he said, Tim is hands down the person that you need to get in touch with. So Tim, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, Tim is a senior investment officer, like uh, Aaron had mentioned before, at Ventas. But not only that, he also heads the Research and Innovation Diversity Group at Ventas. Tim, I'd like you to share a little bit more about your involvement in the Research and Innovation Diversity Group and its impact in senior housing. But before we get into that, I'd like to, the audience to get a 30,000 foot level of the state of the senior living market today. Um, wow, that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> uh, Juan, thanks for having me. It's, it's, it's really an honor to be here and present to you guys. Uh, I, I want to back up a little bit. Um, my bio, it, well, my titles are, are quite a mouthful. And really what that references is that Ventos, we really have four food groups, which are senior housing, which is 50% of our book, medical office building, hospitals, and research and innovation, which we call life science. I co-lead that business but I also work in our senior housing space as well. Um, so that's kind of the reason that I'm here. And again, as Siobhan said, it was really through a connection with Lucas McCurdy, who I did uh, his podcast a couple of years ago. Uh, with regards to the state of senior housing, I mean, anybody who has a newspaper or a computer um, pretty much knows that we've obviously had some occupancy challenges uh, given everything that's happening in the COVID world. Um, I guess once March came, uh, buildings, not just our buildings, but all buildings had challenges around uh, move-ins, obviously. You also couldn't um, do tours, which impacted occupancy. So there were far more move-outs than move-ins. So net occupancy, I think that last I saw was down probably 10%. 
Uh, the good news is that seems to be leveling off a little bit on, you know, now most buildings are allowing tours. Uh, so marketing efforts are picking up. One of the other challenges was, as all of you know, in senior housing, the end user is really not the consumer. Uh, the consumer are adult children. So you also had situations where you're moving your parent into a building. And I say parent because most residents are, are single, unfortunately. But anyway, you're moving a parent or parents in some cases into a building, but the problem is they had to uh, quarantine in some cases from seven to as long as 14 days. So you have a situation where you have someone moving into a building who's already somewhat reluctant about leaving their home and now they're being put into this new environment and during that whole time period, the initial time period where there's really an adjustment, they're now you know relegated only to their apartment, eating alone in their apartment. So it really was counterintuitive to what the real competitive advantage in senior housing has always been, which is the socialization. So the good news is, you know, those things seem to be clearing. Um, so hopefully we will see, you know, more upticks in occupancy and kind of getting back to business as normal. But um, I think big picture senior housing is obviously still, like I said, it's 50% of our book. So it's a large, um, it's a business that we have, you know, a, we're very bullish on and continue to make investments in, um, so. Oh, thanks, Tim. I did, uh, that was a lot to unpack. I appreciate you, you looking at that. So are you, you talked about the adult child making a lot of these decisions. Um, where are there specific areas of interest across the United States where um, we're seeing more activity than not? Well, yeah. interestingly enough, um, and it's really almost contrary to conventional thinking, Senior housing really doesn't follow the Sunbelt locations like, you know, like people tend to think, especially those outside the industry. The reality is there's really not a specific geographic target. It's really driven by market and personal dynamics. For instance, some seniors want to reside in their hometowns to stay close to family and friends. And as an example of that, um, there's a very successful um, active adult operator in Western New York. Uh, which is Buffalo, which clearly has a lot of winter and their builders do really, really well because, you know, people native to that part of the country tend to want to stay in that part of the country. You have others who want to live near their adult children and grandchildren. So they will relocate to a city where and move into facilities to be closer to, you know, to their immediate families. And then lastly, you have some, <clears throat> excuse me, who are driven by more economic forces. And they will move to the middle of the country and secondary and tertiary markets where their retirement dollars can stretch further. And usually these people will also tend to pick places that have better weather. Because if you're opting to move, you're not generally not going to move to a place that has worse weather than where you're coming from. You want to be where it's warm all the time, but also, you know, take advantage of, you know, lower rates where your money will go further. So you'll have, you know, there are parts of Florida. Um, smaller cities in Florida, uh, places in Texas, and all throughout the Southwest, South, Southeast and Southwest. So I think it's really dependent upon what the driving forces are for the individual who's going to be, who's going to be making the move. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be cognizant of our, our audience here and not a lot of, um, some people may not be aware of what senior living actually encompasses. So just to give the high level abbreviation, we, we have you encompass independent living, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing, correct? Correct. And then there's, there's a, it, another that's becoming more and more popular. Well, what I referenced earlier was active adult, which are really kind of age restricted apartments for the most part. And, you know, most states is 55 plus, others is 62 plus, but generally they are your traditional multifamily buildings without a lot of other bells and whistles, but everyone who lives there is, you know, in the same cohort from an age perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, 55 is just a cutoff for, to avoid age discrimination, but in general, the average age of residents in an active adult is probably 70. And that's been kind of for a, a while. Are there any new typologies, mingling of assisted living and independent living together? Have, have you guys looked at any opportunities there? Well, that's a great question. And actually, depending on the operator, you will generally have 
ILAL, oh, excuse me, I won't use acronyms, independent assisted together. In some cases, you'll have independent assisted in memory care, and in other cases, assisted in memory care. And the reason for that is it allows your uh, residents to age in place. So again, it takes some of the pressure off the adult child having to move their parent when their situations change. So someone may come into a building in an IL, you know, in an IL unit, and as they're going through their annual or semi-annual assessments, if they notice changes, if the operator notices changes, they'll suggest to the adult child that your parent is probably going to be better served in, excuse me, in assisted living because they need more help with um, with activities of uh, daily living, what we call ADLs. And then also, same situation, you can have someone who comes in and they do the initial assessment and they're placed in assisted living, but um, situations change and they recognize that they're probably going to be now better served in a memory care unit. So you do have some unit, some buildings, excuse me, that encompass one, two, or all three. And then you also have standalone memory care, standalone assisted living, and standalone independent living. So it really kind of depends on uh, how the operator likes to operate, because some operators also specialize. Some just are, you know, solely memory care operators, and some are better at independent or assisted living. Great. So say you're a new developer that's new to the senior living world, and you're kicking a tire thinking about getting into this um, market sector. What what are you guys looking at as uh, far as investing with that new developer? What are the key indicators that say, this is gonna be a successful um, community. I wanna participate and, and partner with this, this group. Well, if it's new build, the first thing we're gonna look at is experience. You know, and there's, and there's kind of two things that you've touched on. There's actually the developer and there's also the operator because they're generally not the same. In some cases they are, but that's pretty rare. Um, even when the developer and the operator are the same, they're still going to be, you know, a general contractor and all the other things that are requisite of uh, a construction project. But it's really a matter of one: have they done it? And it, and to back up, number one is market study. Is there enough demand in the market to support a new building? What does a competitive set look like? Is a competitive set older? Are there new buildings that haven't filled up? What is the market occupancy? But assuming they check all of those boxes, then it really becomes experience. Have they built buildings before? Have they done ground up buildings? Have they delivered them on budget? What's the brand experience like? And then you kind of transition to the operator. Has the operator you know, operated new buildings where they've had to fill a building up from empty um, so what's their experience like? And then lastly, but not, I mean, it's just as important as the financial wherewithal, because when you're talking about a new bill, there's also kind of a whole ramp up, right? So when they open it up, it's not going to have enough residents to, you know, to break even. And generally in senior housing, break even is probably around 80% occupancy, give or take. So do they have the financial wherewithal to basically lease this thing up and continue to meet all of their obligations? Because what happens when you open a new building is even though you may only have, you know, 20% occupancy, all of the operating expenses kick in day one because of the regulatory environment. So you need all of the staffing as though the building were full. So you really need, like I said, significant financial wherewithal to kind of weather that storm. Got it. And you see, I hear a lot of activity. Let's talk about um, mergers and acquisitions. There's been a lot of M&A activity uh, as of lately. And what, what can you speak to that's driving this change? What does it mean for senior living looking ahead? Is there, is there something that's driving this? Um, well, it's a couple of things. I, I think the one, or there's, there's always yield chasing, right? Because when you look at the cap rates and other asset classes in real estate, senior housing always tends to trend toward the higher side. So you have a lot of liquidity in the market right now, chasing a lot of deals. So I think senior housing looks very, very attractive in terms of the return opportunities. And there's also been the always the underlying theme that the aging demographics in this country are, all, are going to create situations where senior housing is uh, also very attractive. Um, but the flip side of it, some of the M&A activity is you're seeing some of the weaker players who don't have some of the characteristics I talked about earlier in terms of financial wherewithal, 
especially now, given what's going on with the economy, looking to cash out or, or sell. So, you know, there's been a lot of big deals in the market. Um, but for the most part, it's really operators who have operated buildings for quite a while selling to private equity and or um, or other larger operators. But there's a lot of uh, private equity capital in our space as well. So and so they're and they're constantly chasing transactions. So you have, you know, families that may have operated businesses, you know, one or two generations who are now looking for an exit. And I think private equity really kind of provides that equity, you know, that exit for them. And then you also have people like us, REITs, um, who, you know, by definition, we have to invest capital. So we're also always looking for deals. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I listened to your podcast and, and I, I agree. We, we have typically been a siloed uh, industry in the past. And, and when you look at it over the past 10, 20 years, and I know Ventas, uh, the portfolio, as you mentioned, Tim, it ranges from healthcare to life science and senior living being 50% of that, the, the biggest share of that. So what can you speak to as far as flexibility and diversity um, you know, before we you know, we're talking about the mergers and acquisitions, is there any cross pollination that can happen um, to the healthcare side? W what are the opportunities that were that are there that we could look to? Well, um, there are a couple that come to mind. I, I think um, specifically is multi generational because that can that I think that this whole like I said, you know, to kind of go back. The end user in our business is not the consumer. So you have these adult children and there's still a fair amount of guilt associated when you're making that decision because by definition, you're moving your parent into a situation where they don't want to move into. And it's only because they have to in most cases because they can't, they no longer should live alone. So I think to assuage some of that guilt, there's going to be opportunities where you can have multi-generational buildings where or facilities where you have single family housing development that may have like an independent living building, you know, within walking distance. So people can share meals together um, and also kind of shared activities because, you know, I think that also kind of helps with the, the mental health of the residents because they're around younger people all the time. Um, another area is, um, a specific example is a former coworker of mine went to work for a hotel business. Um, and their, their specialty was really building hotels in college towns. Uh, their flag is called the graduate. So there are places like Ann Arbor, uh, Providence, a couple of the big, you know, a couple of the college towns, Bloomington, Indiana, but they brought him on to start a, um, a division of their company to, uh, to work with hospitals. And the thesis was that, say you're, you know, you have a family member who's at the Mayo Clinic getting cancer treatment. They're going to be there for like three weeks. The 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 caregiver or the family members at the end of the day can go back to the hotel, have a place to relax. So you're close by, but you kind of have the ability to turn, you know, to go kind of back and forth because you're going to be there for a while. So now they're looking to start to build uh, hotels, ground up development hotels near major hospitals that attract national and international customers, uh, excuse me, patients. So, you know, I think multi-generational is one kind of like this, this hotel thing, which is a little unique, but I think as, again, there's so much liquidity chasing deals, there's just gonna be a lot more creativity. And I can tell you also internationally, and internationally there are a couple culture challenges that, um, that have impacted our space in terms of design and the way buildings lay out. For instance, an operator I know built a building in Mexico City, and in most senior housing uh, buildings, the dining room are two tops and four tops for the tables, right? And they noticed that at dinner in this building in Mexico City, people were pushing the tables together because all of the family members would show up at dinner time to eat with their family member who was a resident in the building. So now you had basically, you know, they needed nine and 10 tops. So that was, uh, I think that was a culture shock for them. So it's really kind of recognizing that one thing about senior housing is definitely not a one size fits all product, product. And I think the other thing we'll start to see, and I'm surprised it hasn't taken off more, is more affinity marketing, right? 
Um, for instance, there's a company called Priya, P-R-I-Y-A, uh, based in Southern California, and they cater strictly to the uh, Southeast Asian market, mostly Indians. Um, their buildings have Indian food, uh, Bollywood movies, um, in, um, Hindi speaking, uh, excuse me, employees there. So it's, and because of that, they're actually able to get higher rents than market because they're now targeting, you know, a specific affinity group. And I could see that also in the LGBTQ community and, you know, various other, you know, affinity groups. So I could also see a trend where you start to see smaller, more specialized buildings as well. Well, I love all this diversity. We've come a, a long way in the past, yes. past decade and, and 50 years, most definitely. So I want to circle back, Tim, to your involvement in the research and uh, innovation diversity group. Um, can you talk about that a little bit more and how that will impact our industry? Sure. Well, first, let me um, separate the two of those. It's um, I co-head our research and innovation group, and I'll speak to that in a minute. But the, the, what it means when it says that I'm the diversity network sponsor, that is within Ventos' own affinity group for the diverse employee group. So that's more of a, that's an internal function. Um, but I, and we can come back to that in a minute. But with regards to R&I, research and innovation, and, and just to be clear uh, for anybody listening in, that's really what we have branded our life science business. So what that business is, we have a development partner, a company called Wexford Science and Technology based in Baltimore. And we provide the capital and they provide the development expertise and we do ground up development of office lab space, either universe, either on university campuses or university adjacent. So we have deals at um, in Providence with Brown, we have deals at Yale, uh, Penn and Drexel, University of Pittsburgh, University of Miami, Duke, Wake, Washington U and St. Louis. Um, we're looking at a deal at Cal Davis in Sacramento, Arizona State. So that business is really to kind of, it, it, the healthcare component of it is most of the tenants are uh, research companies that have spun off from the universities, either through the uh, professors and or students who want to monetize ideas and they need to be close to the intellectual capital of the schools. So we build, like I said, these are usually 250, 300,000 square foot buildings and we lease them out to, you know, drug developers as an example or anything kind of with a healthcare component. So that's where the research and innovation piece comes in. So as you can imagine right now, given everything that's going on with you know COVID and, and, and cancer research and things, there's no shortage of tenants looking for lab space. And in fact, we also have in Philly a shared lab um, tenant, a company called CIC and Biolabs. And what they do is you say you're a two or three person you know, startup, you can lease from them one or two benches which can be anywhere from a thousand to two thousand square feet, and obviously a you know an office landlord like us would not want to rent one or two thousand square foot you know offices. So CIC will allow you to come in, lease lab space, and then as you grow and get more funding, ideally it kind of feeds the ecosystem, and then you become a tenant for a full a full blown suite. And we've seen success there, where we had tenants who've kind of gone through started at CIC and are now, you know, office tenants of ours. So that's what that business, and that's, that, like I said, of our four food groups right now, it's the smallest, but it's probably getting the most attention because of, you know, it's a hot business right now and it, you know, represents a huge growth engine for us. I love how <laughs> the four food groups <laughs> together. Um, so I wanna leave some time for some Q and A. Okay. Tim, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Great insight. So we're going to hand this off to Aaron, who's going to check uh, for uh, questions. From there have been some great questions. I'm really excited and um, no surprise. Okay. Oh, yeah. So let's jump in. First, um, there's a question around, there's been a trend of having each level of care siloed, even if, um, for instance, it's in uh, and, and there's two different questions that relate to this, both one about continuing care retirement communities, 
Um, and then thinking about even how that care is siloed within something like a CRCC and how people that maybe have um, a loved one that needs one level of care, but they need a different level of care might be siloed from one another. And so the question is, how are you seeing this change if you are, and how are you suggesting that you might want to see it change? Okay, um, I'll start with the former. It has not been a lot of change around it, but I think the reason for that is that levels of care also require different um, real estate solutions, I guess is the easiest yeah. way to say. For instance, like a memory care resident has to be in a lockdown unit. I mm -hmm. mean, because one of the things that is very, very common for Alzheimer patients is um, they have huge elopement risk, which is, you know, and, and I'm not saying that they're going to run away and get married to another resident. They literally will walk out of the building given the opportunity. So those units have to always be locked down. And that's why also when you see the design of memory care, either memory care units or memory care standalone buildings, there's always an outdoor walking area. The residents will just, you know, just like to wander. Um, and you also see them doing it in the lockdown unit around the halls. But there are situations, to your point, where you have a husband wife, where one is in the assisted living unit, and then they have a, um, their spouse is in the um, memory care. And the good news is the, the one that has more acuity, the AL resident, the assistant living resident, can go and visit in the memory care. So there is still some continuity there. Where it becomes a challenge is around pricing because this is not the cheapest product, you know, by any stretch. So now you have, you may have somebody who has, you know, they're paying rent on an assisted living unit and then also have to pay rent on a memory care unit, which is significantly higher due to the, uh, to the care of those required. So that's a challenge where, you know, kind of segueing into your second part of your question, it's, it's kind of hard to design around that because there are just some things that, you know, are just required. Now, independent and assisted, um, there's generally going to be less segregation around, you know, the floors. And what happens is you may have separate uh, dining or separate um, activity rooms. So that you, you get some design um, differences there. But one of the other things that's always interesting in, the, in our space is that one of the things you say when you start to try to integrate across care levels is that the people who have lower who have lower acuity, which is an inverse in senior housing, it means they are you know, more mentally aware. The first thing they always say, but I don't want to live around old people. It's like, but you're 80. But it's like, so there's also, you know, that whole thing because, and, and one of the things that we're seeing is that what I call acuity creep. And what that means is that as occupancy is trending down, there's a lot of pressure on operators to keep heads in the beds. So you will co out tour buildings now, well, when we could tour buildings that are independent, but you see a lot more wheelchairs and walkers around the dining room. So it's really suggested those are more like assisted living residents. And then even on the assisted living side, you see people who look like they're gonna be better served in a nursing home, but there's so much pressure to keep occupancy up that you see the operators kind of keep people longer than they should. And that also impacts their margins because now you have an independent building that you're treating residents who should be in assisted living and you're not collecting assisted living rents. Mm -hmm. So that, that's super helpful, thank you. So like, are you seeing overall, I mean, I think that that addresses, you know, potentially campuses like CRCCs, um, but are you seeing that also um, be a trend towards more of those campuses versus, you know, single facilities within a, a city? It depends. Um, and, and I'm not hedging. I, I, I think what you're suggesting makes a lot of sense. But the issue is the one trend that we're seeing, like across a lot of asset classes in real estate is more urbanization, right? Mm -hmm. Because when I first got into this business, you know, more years than I care to mention, um, it was what I used to call like the shady acres where all the facilities were, you know, 10, 20, 30 miles away from the city center. The next wave of seniors doesn't really want to do that. They want to be around, you know, entertainment, restaurants. They want walkability. So you're seeing also more infill and more, you know, 
retrofit in some cases, conversions. So it's really hard to build these, you know, facilities of the size that you're talking about in urban locations. So the trick becomes, if you want this big campus, by definition, you're going to have to probably be in the suburb, one, because the land is a lot cheaper. So do you do that? And, you know, are you now bucking the trend that people want to be in the suburbs? So haven't seen a lot of it. Uh, I think that there's probably an opportunity there for, you know, as I said before, secondary and tertiary cities where you can get land at, you know, much cheaper prices. You know, we see stuff, you know, in South Carolina, North Carolina, places like that. And also places that have, you know, better tax um, situations for seniors, i.e. Florida and Delaware, Texas, where there's no state income tax, because these are people by definition who have fixed income. So I think, you know, the big campuses that, that you're describing don't see a lot of new build in that space. Um, there are some CCRCs that, that we do see, you know, in cities, but, you know, you're, you're, you're really focusing on a finite number of residents who can afford it. I mean, there are buildings that are going up in Manhattan now that memory care units are going for $17,000, $18,000 a month. And there just aren't a lot of seniors who can afford that. I mean, assisted living rates in, you know, places like San Francisco and New York are, you know, well north of 10,000. So it's, so there are a lot of challenges around. I mean, the things that you're describing make perfect sense, but there are a lot of economic challenges around it. Yeah, no, and that's, I mean, I think just with your response, you already addressed um, a number of the other questions around sort of why it is, you know, that we're seeing when senior living comes into an urban area, there isn't a whole lot of you know, green space, for instance, um, and the conversation around, you know, is it about it being too pricey and, and how do we open up some of that green space? I, let me kind of combine uh, that with, with I think, a, a question that you're also, you know, coming into, which is how do we handle creating senior living communities that don't feel isolated from the community around them? Um, yeah, and I, I think part of it is urbanization, without a doubt. But, you know, back to your, your first point, you know, one model that we've seen has, has worked um, effectively in terms of the green space yeah. is really taking advantage of green space that already exists. For instance, there is a trend now towards senior housing around college campuses. There's a Ooh. building out near UCLA. Uh, there's a building near UC San Diego. Uh, there's a couple of them in Texas. But long story short, you have um, a couple of a couple market drivers there. One, again, beating this dead horse, adult children are the decision makers. So academicians and professors by definition have the type of financial resources that they can have their parents living in the, you know, now they're living close by. And you also have people who have a strong affinity for their alma maters, who wanna kind of come back to the college town. So you have a lot of alumni who live in these buildings. So now you have, the ability to have activities like at the UCLA building, for example, or the building on UCLA's campus. Residents can audit classes. You can use the activities. Uh, they have, you know, they, they use the van and take people to the games. Or you can just, you know, if you're, you know, mobile, you can walk and just kind of hang out on campus where there's already kind of some built in green space. So that's one way to do it. The other way is as you see buildings coming into cities, Maybe you want to be close by to a park, which creates a competitive advantage because to your point, it's really not a scenario where you can kind of create green space in an urban environment and the cohort that you're appealing to, you probably don't want to have like rooftop decks and things like that for obvious reasons. So I think some of the challenges around it are addressed by, you know, by the locations that you pick. And I'm sure that these buildings can, you know, can collect a premium if they're located, like I said, walking distance to a park and things like that. Yeah. So, all right, there's a million questions, which I love, um, but let me just end with this one before we move into the panel. Um, as it relates to multi-generational developments, have you seen that adult daycare or ch ch child daycare facilities being successful? I've, not that we own, but I have seen deals like that, and it definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, 
especially on probably on the child daycare side, because really you kind of check two boxes because clearly in our country there there's, there's, it's always a challenge for, you know, for employees, what do they do about childcare? So now if, you know, especially your caregivers and your, you know, your dietary employees, people like that, they can, you know, bring their child to work and have onsite daycare. I think, you know, that kind of facilitates, you know, the quality of the employees that you can get and also how, retaining employees, which is always a challenge in our business. <laughs> Adult daycare, um, have not seen that operated within um, a senior housing facility, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. I think that there's also a piece of that. You also have respite care where you have uh, adult children whose parents live with them. They want to go on vacation and they have their parents stay in a building for a week or two weeks, things like that, um, which also becomes somewhat of a transition in the senior housing because now you kind of their parent has gotten the free look and says, "Oh, this is pretty cool. There's other people here. I wouldn't live mm-hmm. here." Um, one thing I will touch touch on real quickly on the adult daycare though, um, they have done a great. That's an industry that's done a really good job at appealing to. Um, targeted marketing on, among affinity groups. Mm-hmm. I used to work for a company that owned, um, had a major investment in the chain of adult daycares. And each building speci- um, specialized in different uh, ethnic backgrounds. So you had Russian buildings, where it was Russian television, Russian newspapers. Um, you had eight people appealing, you know, buildings that appealed to the Asian community. So it allowed them to kind of be comfortable in this environment then at the end of the day go back either to home if they lived alone or back to you know to be with their children if they lived in a multi-generational setting from a home perspective so i just did want to add that from adult daycare there has been a lot of success around affinity marketing and for those in dallas we we actually have done a ccrc uh, actually healthcare building with an adult daycare uh, that just opened up about two years ago or one year ago, excuse me. So for those that are interested, check out uh, CC Young uh, over by White Rock Lake in Dallas. Um, it's, it's a great solution for those who don't necessarily want to commit to uh, living in uh, the health building or the CCRC. Um, it it kind of d- dabbles in, and it's a lower cost to entry. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. I, the, the challenges around adult daycare from our recollection are always around the regulatory piece because for the most part, adult daycare also has to provide the transportation. So, you know, they, they pick up and drop off and the number of hours that you are allowed, at least here in Maryland, um, to have the residents on a daily basis, the transportation is included. So that was always a challenge that you needed to locate within a, you know, you had needed to pick locations that was close enough to all of your customers so that you can pick them up and drop them off and still be within the prescribed period of hours that you're allowed on a daily basis. Awesome. Super helpful. Um, and I think is a great segue into the panel um, that we're about to have. So um, in part because, you know, every time I hear Janie talk, I just love her policy wonk perspective um, and also her boots on the ground um, understanding of the community. And I think some of the things that you brought up are really, you know, hard to solve with design alone and need a more systemic approach. Um, so let's just move into that. I, I thought, you know, um, Janie, Melissa, and Grant, if you could turn on your cameras um, and join the panel. Um, Melissa, I would love if you could sort of kick us off with a few words about legacy senior communities and the recent Midtown Park location, which is where Siobhan and Janie first met um, when she was assisting the planning commissioner. And I think really um, understanding what that project, um, which I believe is about to open in January, can teach us um, about some of these issues um, and then sort of using that as a jumping off point to talk about a lot of different um, approaches to design. Sure. Good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be here, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about Legacy Midtown Park and just Legacy Senior Communities. It was very interesting to hear 
Tim's comments, because we can relate in this industry to a lot about what he's talking about. And, you know, Legacy Senior Communities is a nonprofit Jewish sponsored organization that has existed for almost 70 years in Dallas. We started in, you know, skilled nursing, which was the only type of senior living um, 70 years ago and uh, in Golden Acres and had a, a national reputation for quality of senior care. And that has grown over the decades to where now we have a community in um, North Plano that is a life care CCRC. It's very suburban. It's on, I think about 27 acres. Um, we have independent living assisted memory support and a skilled nursing facility there. We also have a home and community based uh, organization that provides home health and personal assistance services and hospice care. And then our most recent project that we we're very excited about, um, and as Aaron mentioned, is the Legacy Midtown Park. Uh, it is also a CCRC, um, whereas the uh, Plano uh, community is a entry fee life care. Uh, this is a rental community, so we're excited to have both a entry fee life care as well as a rental community under um, the organization's um, purview. And, you know, the thing about a rental is it's much more accessible. You do not have to have a significant life care deposit. Obviously, you don't also then get the health benefits that you get as you move through the continuum. Um, but we felt like it was a um, better entry point or access, provided better access to the broader Dallas Jewish community to have a rental community. Um, the challenge with that, and I think as Tim might have alluded to, is that when you're a rental community, um, you don't have those life care deposits to come up with, it, which is basically typically what your equity is uh, when you start to open and develop a new community. So it was really due to the success of the organization over the decades and the generous um, donations from the uh, Dallas Jewish community that provided us about $35 million in equity in order to open a brand new CCRC that's rental. Um, what makes Legacy unique is that our rental community is, uh, has the sim similar amenities and is very, you know, five star in its feel, um, just like our entry fee community, which is a little bit unusual. Um, and we're hoping will be a real market differentiator for us. And it's what's really important is that in both of our communities that whether you're in independent living or assisted living or memory support or skilled nursing, um, we've really worked hard to make it a very residential feel. So it doesn't feel clinical. It feels very um, much like you're at home um, with wonderful outdoor and indoor common spaces that hopefully someday we'll get beyond the pandemic so that we can fully utilize those. Um, our healthcare center actually opened in uh, July. So we have residents in our healthcare center right now. We're moving in our first assisted living resident today. So assisted living and memory support is um, open as of today. And then the community that we'll be opening around the 1st of February is independent living. We have 184 independent living apartments and they are in mid-sized um, two eight-story towers. Uh, we have our assisted living and memory support building is three floors. The top floor is memory support and there are 36 residences there, 32 apartments, um, four of which are uh, semi-private. And then we have 51 assisted living memory apartments uh, from studio to one bedroom to two bedroom on the first and second floor of our um, uh, assisted living and memory support building. And then lastly, our healthcare center has 54 beds. About two thirds of those are for short term rehab. Um, the other third is for long term care. Um, so, really excited to share more. <laughs> Thank you so much for that overview. Um, it's really Fascinating to hear the, the wealth of different options that you guys have and the different types of care. Um, so I, I wanted to jump into um, first talking about, you know, as we think about designing for senior housing, there's no doubt that safe and secure have to be essential principles, right? Um, but that can also, it doesn't have to, but a lot of times it can come at the cost of sort of a vibrance or life of a place. Um, and you know, I'd love to hear about what are some of the strategies that we can use to ensure safe and secure um, while also engaging in the public. Um, and Janie, I was wondering if you could maybe share some of the initial thinking through this project and, and what some of you guys thoughts were around making something um, that could help to achieve that and how to think beyond that. Sure, well, thank you. 
Um, you know, it was really great working with Legacy because they wanted to be able to engage with the community, but at the same time, of course, um, ensure the safety of their own uh, residents. So where we worked together was through the sidewalks, through the trees, having benches around, things that would enable not only residents to be able to feel like they could um, have the neighborhood be part of their housing, but also have the neighborhood feel like legacy was part of their neighborhood. Um, and so that's just a very simple way was in making sure that there was plenty of shade on the streets, you know, here in Texas and benches and that the sidewalks were wide enough to, you know, to be, to have um, wheelchairs, for example, um, but, you know, but also pedestrians. So I think that that's one very, very simple way. And then the other is where it's located um, also includes sort of this giant um, circle around that we hope down the road, it's like a cul-de-sac almost. And so we hope that down the road, um, Legacy will then engage their own neighbors in being able to utilize that space as a community space for various events or things like that, that they could bring everyone together when the time is right. It's awesome, thank you. Um, Melissa, do you think you could talk a little bit about um, that specific location? You chose an urban infill location. What was driving that? You know, we talked a little bit about that earlier, but I'd love to dig into that more. Sure, well, as, as Tim mentioned, uh, People like to live uh, in senior living in the area that they grew up, right? In, in an area that feels like their neighborhood, feels like home. So I'd say the, the largest driver, the initial driver was that this space is just right in the heart of the Dallas Jewish community. It's located very close to numerous um, Jewish schools and temples and synagogues, um, also the JCC and the uh, Jewish Federation of Dallas. Um, we're also nestled between two premier healthcare systems, between Medical City and uh, Texas Health Resources. So that's really helpful for our licensed areas. Um, and it does have a very urban feel. Um, as Janie mentioned, there has been a lot of development just in the last five years, it, specifically in that area. There's um, a roundabout with a nice, um, you know, kind of beautifully landscaped place in the middle of the roundabout. We have put um, benches and trees and we're, we're hoping to, um, as the area develops, get to have it to be more of a residential feel with people out walking around. You know, the trail um, that the trails down there keep getting connected where you can walk forever, you know, um, and so that will be a nice place for our seniors and even our activities director to kind of help provide some outdoor exercise and, and space. And then that, you know, the dart rail runs right along our property and initially people are a little bit worried about the sound, but you, you can't hear it at all. And it's a split second when it goes by, but we've had some other people say, you know, it's a really nice way to feel like you're connected to a city, you know, that you live in a city and um, not um, out removed from the places that you feel comfortable. So it was only 10 acres that made it a little bit of a challenge and Siobhan can probably talk about, you know, the challenge of designing on that. And so we don't have as much green space as we do in our suburban property um, up in North Plano. But I think that um, Siobhan and the team have done a tremendous job of taking advantage of every little area that we have wonderful intimate outdoor spaces. We've got a gorgeous amenity deck in the independent, between the independent living um, towers that has um, fire pits and a bocce court and a graffiti wall and a butterfly garden and um, some outdoor dining and several fire pits and there'll be music out there. So we're finding ways to make sure that people feel like they've got use of an outdoor space. We did squeeze in a little putting green um, on the south end of the property. So, you know, even though we didn't have as much land, I think we're making, taking full advantage of what we do have. So I'm definitely going to come back to that graffiti wall um, point, but um, I want to I want to follow up on um, some of what you're mentioning around uh, the the placement and some of the attributes along. We know transport is a huge deal, um, and ask Tim, you know, what of these factors sort of come into play when it comes to financing? When we start to think about you know positioning a facility, for instance. Um, hmm. So I want to make sure I'm ask, answering the right question. Are you saying like if we're evaluating a transaction, how important it is or how do we look at 
access to transportation? I mean, overall, when you think about um, investing in, for instance, an urban site that has that has the potential to have, you know, better integration into a you know transportation network um, versus a more suburban site. Sort of, how are you guys um, weighing those options of land cost versus some of the availability of, of different resources, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think it plays less into well. Let me back up a little bit. When we Ventos are looking at deals, as a capital provider, most of the time deals come to us are fully baked, meaning that the developer or the operator, whoever is wants to do a transaction, they're bringing us a deal. So it's gonna have a budget. So the land cost is really already built in. We're not really doing kind of organic turnkey deals where we go out access a site, buy the land, and then find an operator. So our involvement really comes in after a lot of those decisions have been made. Now, with, in terms of the evaluation, I think where it becomes a factor is if the land cost is, is a significant portion of the budget, what happens is and that drives into what type of rents do you need to get in order to cover that cost and make a decent return, right? So it's really more a matter of what type of cap rate, you know, from a value, you know, from a valuation perspective, is, is going to be placed on the operating income, really, which flows back through to the budget. So, you know, I th I don't think we're evaluating it really from the cost, but I do think there's a lot of underwriting that goes into why you pick a particular location, and how is it really senior friendly, um, especially on urban locations. I mean, because obviously. Like for instance, buildings in New York, there's always a lot of um, question around, you know, is it user friendly for seniors in terms of navigating the sidewalks, things like that. With regards to transportation, less of an issue because once you get past independent, there aren't a lot of drivers that are really the residents of the building. So for the most part, they're relying on the van from the building or in urban environments, now you have obviously Uber and all these other, you know, car sharing services to kind of address that. So the cohort that we're selling to is really less um, transportation centric for the most part. Because the other thing is, you know, the average age of the residents in the buildings is, is you know, probably 75 or so, and probably north of 80 in assisted living. So there, these aren't people who are going to be worried about, you know, access to public transportation. But I think, the, you know, the answer to your question is, is the land cost will have a significant issue around the budget. And then does the deal really pencil out? But when I get a deal, there's already going to be all that information is already going to be included. So thinking about, um, you know, something that I've heard all of us talk about in different ways is, is understanding that senior living, the type of senior living that we're talking about is still out of reach for many, many Americans. And I think really one of the things that I'd love to open up and to explore are the solutions that we're seeing for serving this missing middle and lower income. Um, and I thought maybe Grant, you could kick us off with sort of talking about that specific issue um, and what you're seeing as, as the role of design. Thanks, Aaron. I think that's probably one of the biggest questions that's close to my heart is how do we serve the, the middle market because it's vastly underserved in the United States. And I, I see, I can use, I can tell you about two examples that are, that are probably the best illustrations I've seen so far. One organization is actually building tiny homes for seniors. They don't look like mobile homes. They don't look like the tiny homes you see on all 29 of the tiny homes shows you see on HGTV. They're actually very nice, but small homes and they're for sale, they're not for rent. So they're trying a different approach and they're doing it in, in what are called secondary markets and tertiary markets, smaller cities, smaller towns and in suburbs where the land is more affordable for people and they're keeping those costs low. And so they're, a little, they're basically active adult, but with a little bit of independent living services thrown in that are more a la carte. And that seems, that seems to be getting a lot of traction. Another one is called Elevate. It's an, it's an affordable assisted living and memory support program that they're taking all over the country. And they're also targeting that same 
that same geographical location, those secondary cities. They're not trying to get into downtown Dallas. They're not trying to get into downtown Atlanta. They're trying to get into those areas that are underserved, where the people actually live, where their favorite restaurants are, where their families are, where their churches are, to serve those people in their local neighborhoods and local jurisdictions and local um, areas. And they do it by keeping all of, basically all of the apartments in an Elevate community or studio. That, they, that way it increases the key count but keeps the cost and square footage lower. And they're also limiting their services. They're recognizing that not everybody needs every single service under the sun in assisted living and in memory support. So they're gonna work harder to tailor those services to the individual and provide just what they need, but nothing more to try and keep those costs down as well. And are you seeing those, tell us, tell us a little bit more. I think it's such a fascinating concept. So um, I heard you both say, you know, a tiny home and an apartment. So help kind of paint the picture of where these might be located and how they're clustered. Is it in an apartment or are they standalone? What is it, does it look different in different locations? And are they owned or are they rented? In the case of Elevate, they're rented. And those are in standalone communities, although they're, they're, their um, model has become so interesting to some people that they're already morphing it into different types of housing options. They're even doing a rural version in Colorado that gets out into rural East Colorado, East Colorado, where there's just not a lot of services out there because there's not a lot of density. And people don't want to leave their ranches and farms and their lifestyle. So they're adapting it to that kind of living. Like um, Tim had talked about with affinity communities, it's almost an affinity community in and of itself. The other one, the Caracasa brand that's doing the small tiny homes, is, mostly, is almost all for sale. But they're also trying now to work with home builders to get into other, other, other uh, housing developments to start to intermix some of these in so that they can, people can stay wow. closer to their loved ones and their grandchildren. So thank you so much. Janie, do you want to talk about sort of some of the policy that maybe makes that possible or stops that from being possible and what you'd like to see that look like? Sure. I mean, I think so much of this is political will and um, for leaders to want to have the kind of communities that they talk about, but then actually walk their own talk in terms of policy. And so for example, um, we have to allow um, for more density in single family neighborhoods um, so that we could put, there's no reason at all that you couldn't take three or four lots in the middle of a single family neighborhood and make one little you know, tiny home affinity community or not affinity, just a tiny home community. Um, and changing those kind of zoning codes, uh, there, there's, it's really just an issue of political will. Um, the other issue I think that goes with it is within current markets, uh, we have quite a few uh, companies that um, do, do uh, co-housing in one house in a single family neighborhood. And we're allowed to have that by state law, but because the number of residents that are non-related is limited by state law, um, they're limited. And if they can't be profitable, they're not gonna do it. And so we have to be able to allow within the most strict safety and security you know, regulations in terms of fire and sprinkling and all the stuff that would have the safety, um, we have to allow them to have more people living there because there's no reason bedrooms need to be traditional single family size bedrooms if you've got larger communal space. Um, and then I think the final piece that's, you know, on everyone's mind and in so many cities they've breached it, but in Dallas, not so much yet. And that's the whole accessory dwelling unit piece. Um, it's a pretty simple solution, especially if you want your own parent to be able to live near you and maybe they need minimal care um, to have accessory dwelling units be allowed by right um, in, in single family neighborhoods. And a lot of times, you know, the fear of what is unimagined is what causes the backlash and the NIMBY movements. And, you know, we don't want this in our neighborhood because, I mean, I don't know anyone who's gonna lease that, so a, a building in their own backyard to someone dangerous. So I don't understand that very much, um, but there are people who just can't imagine what it would look like. And yet, interestingly, and I'll end here, you know, Highland Park, which is, you know, the most elite neighborhood in the Dallas area, they have it all, all throughout. Uh, Highland Park is accessory dwelling units. So um, I think that that's another very simple solution that could add a lot of 
affordable housing in single family neighborhoods. So I'll stop there and let you oh, That's let wonderful. I, um, I have so many um, follow-up questions and maybe, um, so I wanna make sure that we leave time for some of the additional questions and also the Q&A if people have additional questions. I know I've seen a number of them coming in. Um, Melissa, I just wondered if you could share maybe briefly um, and then we'll, we'll hop onto another topic, but I wanted to talk about sort of how Legacy is addressing um, some of this missing middle um, with their um, ranges of unit types and sizes, some of the things that you've shared in the past. Sure, and I agree with, with all the panelists. It's a real challenge for our industry. And um, it was something that as we designed Legacy Midtown Park, we kept at the forefront. Um, but you know, given that the majority of the services we offer are private pay, and you know, the day of a decent long-term care insurance is is you know going by the wayside, it is a lot of money, you know, for someone to pay, especially in our licensed areas, you know, to be in long-term care or memory support or or even assisted living, um, and people are living longer, and so that you know, financial drain has become even more of an issue. Um, so a couple of things, we in our independent living um, added 16 studio apartments, they're about 500 square feet, um, they're still beautiful, they're very open, um, feel very contemporary, um, but it brings down the entry point for an independent living apartment, especially um, for the, um, you know, the, the type of community that Legacy Midtown Park is makes it relatively affordable compared to other high-end um, or, or other high-end competitors. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, have some semi-private, we have four semi-private unit apartments in memory support, um, which brings down, you know, memory support can cost up to $100,000 a year. And again, that's all private um, pay, you know, insurance isn't paying for any of the room and board that comes along with Alzheimer's or dementia. So that brings, um, makes that more affordable. Um, our two bedrooms in assisted living um, are designed in a way that if two people wanted to live in there that were friends or relatives, they each have their own bathroom and they can very much be shared as well. Um, so those were the ways that we looked to um, have our standard CCRC be a little more affordable. Um, but I think as Tim alluded to, you know, we are almost a zero margin business. You know, we were a nonprofit and, and we break even. Um, so there's not much room to reduce the prices lower than they are. Um, we also, as a nonprofit, have the ability to establish a uh, financial assistance fund that we um, raise funds from the Jewish, um, generally the, the Jewish community in hopes that we'll be able to subsidize some people that are in need of that care once their assets run out. Um, but, you know, at $100,000 a year, that's a big um, obligation and we don't ever want to commit to someone and then have them spend their assets down and not have a place to live. So we're being very cautious as we open the community, but that is our long-term goal is to grow an endowment to also help fund some of those people that can't afford that over time. Awesome, thank you so much. So one of the other things that we've sort of talked about or alluded to um, is understanding that it's critical to design with our communities, not just for them. I sometimes joke about being the benevolent overlords. Um, and I'm sort of wondering how, how are you guys an meaningfully engaging with the community and how do we see this as being able to include the seniors that have oftentimes been left out of the conversation either due to their socioeconomic status, race, sexual orientation. Um, and what do you see as the mutual benefit here? Um, and I sort of open it up to whomever would like to respond first. Well, you know, I'll just open it up by saying, you know, to me, the first question that everyone should ask is who's not at the table, you know, and whose voice is not being heard. So, I mean, you should actually start with the seniors. You know, they're not a monolithic group by any stretch of the imagination. Tim talked about affinity groups. Grant talked about, you know, rural urban concepts. So I think that, but not, but on top of that, you know, these are people who are, they're so wise and we forget to ask them um, what kind of housing and what kind of life uh, they, they wanna live. And so I also think that within the, the boom of multifamily 
uh, development, there's also opportunities to mix floors, mix units, mix, you know, and create, be a little bit more creative in terms of, it's not all millennials living in multifamily and there's opportunities for that. Awesome. One of our favorite things to do is to pull what we call stakeholders together, especially with existing communities and really talk to residents, their loved ones, their spouses, their friends, the staff that are gonna be caring for them as well as the investors and the officials and even the firefighters that are going to be responsible for right. an emergency. And I'll tell you two quick stories that just I'll never forget. One of them was renovating a, an existing community in Tulsa. They wanted to basically change the way they were doing their dining service and have more choices and be more casual. They were tired of the formal dining room that never gets used. They didn't want to dress up in a suit and tie anymore. They wanted more casual choices and they wanted those venues to be open longer if they wanted to sleep in or if they wanted a late dinner and they wanted more grab and go opportunities. And so the community had four different venues. And so we phased, we, we came up with a design to try to phase it one at a time to make it as gentle as possible. And in the last town hall meeting we had with the residents, they piped up and almost unanim un unanimously said, why do that? We want these venues now, get it over with. We'll eat, it. We'll eat in the multi-purpose room while you're doing this. And I just thought it was hilarious that they were the ones that wanted us to rip the Band-Aid off. And another one in Beaumont, Texas, they wanted to add a pool because they really needed the pool for their wellness programs and their therapy programs. And they wanted to add another, a second dining venue for a cafe and coffee shop. And normally in communities that we work with, those are kind of hidden in the back for many reasons. And working with these folks, they said, you know what, we want it at the front. We want to show people we're an active community. We want these coffee, this coffee shop at front so that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren on their way home from school can make, a, can make it easier to make a quick visit, stop by, have some ice cream, see, grand, see their grandparents and great-grandparents. And for the pool, they wanted it to be an intergenerational opportunity. So they put it up front, right in everybody's face. And I just love that. And it's been a huge success. Oh, those are such good stories. Um, any, anyone else want to sort of talk about this specific issue or, or any examples that they have around either good or bad, sort of how, how we can engage members of the community and how we find them and reach out to them, um, especially during this time? Yeah, I, I'll add a couple a couple points. Um, really, kind of underscoring what what Janie and Grant said. Uh, obviously, like I said, we're not operators, but you know we have multiple operating partners. The successful operators are really the ones who engage with the residents and treat them with respect. And um, and it sounds simple, right? But and really value their opinions. And what I mean by that is is almost every building has a resident council. And those really should be the people who are kind of determining how the building, not how it's run, but have some say so into programming and things like that. And the successful operators are really the ones who treat the resident councils with respect because it's, it's a lot of times you have to guard against, you know, dismissing seniors because you know they're older. I think Janie kind of commented on it. She's not giving them the requisite level of respect. So that that's a big piece. It's just, you know, making sure you have an active and fully engaged resident council and that it, they have some real power. Um, with regards to Grant's point, we have an operator in Canada because we also do business in Canada. And in Canada, um, especially in Quebec, they hold the product as around seniors as we know it is, is completely different because one in Quebec, I think 80% of residents in Quebec across all age groups are renters. So this whole notion of selling your house and moving into an apartment is that's, that's already taken away because they've been doing it their entire lives. So by, because of that, they get a much younger cohort. Our buildings in Montreal, probably the average age is probably in the 60s. So you see more use of like the activities. Um, and one of the other things, like our operator, uh, a company called Le Groupe Maurice in, in Quebec, one of the things they do in all the buildings, and we first started doing business with them, I thought it was superfluous. They have bowling alleys. But the reason they have bowling alleys is so that when the grandchildren come to visit, they know that they can go bowling and it again, takes away this whole notion that they don't want to go to the building. So they're creating active lobbies and activities so that the whole family wants to be there and they're going to have things to do. The other thing they do in their buildings, unlike in the States, is they put the swimming pool on the main level. Most buildings in the States, the pool is 
in the basement is almost more of an afterthought and because of it, it's never used. When I'm touring buildings up in Canada, people are using the pool all the time. And I think a big part of it is because it's right there where you can see it. And again, you feel like it's more part of the community. So I think there are some design things that can make the uh, buildings a lot more engaging and, and you know, tap into the multi-generational. So that's, that's an example of what I've seen and where it works really effectively. I love that. Um, so, you know, one of the questions that had come in, I think really jives with um, something that I've heard you talk about in the past and sort of something that you were just alluding to around, um, you, you said, we tend to sell the care, but what we don't sell is the socialization. Um, and I think, you know, um, we've talked about how social isolation and loneliness have these well-established negative health impacts and how living alone can increase the risk of early death by 32%. And yet over a quarter of the population lives alone. And that, you know, is only growing right now. And I'm just wondering, you know, I think some of the examples that you've just shared are beautiful ways of, of talking about how do we get that socialization and multiple age groups. Um, maybe you could say a few words about um, when you say we tend to sell, like what, what is, you know, when you think of it from a financing hat, um, what comes to mind? And then Melissa, I would love for you to share the example of the graffiti wall um, as, as a story around this. Tim, do you want? Um, I guess you said, for that, you want me to go first? Or you want that was like three first? questions at once. Um, so, so my question to you would just be, um, when you think around financing and you talk about, you know, we're selling care, but we're not selling social connection. What, do, what did you mean by that? How, okay. What would that look like? See, uh, what I meant, and, and I say it often, um, and it's becoming more and more prevalent, to be honest with you. Socialization is the true competitive advantage of senior housing. I mean, it's, it's, it's the only, I won't say only, but it's the major differentiator in that asset class. And we do a terrible job of selling it. And, and I think a lot of it is because it's intangible. But to your point, there are statistics around why it makes a lot of sense. But also you have to keep in mind that I keep saying this, but you know, the consumer is not the end user. So the consumer of the product doesn't have the socialization issues. They are generally looking for peace of mind and safety for their parent. The problem is that the end user doesn't want to go because in a lot of ways you're looking at your own mortality. So they're like, I'd rather just stay in my house. I'm comfortable with my friends and they may never even see these friends but it's a psychological thing you have to get past. That's why I spoke earlier about, I think respite care is a good way to introduce the product. I think adult daycare is a good way to introduce the product. Now there's some people who take to it right away and say, oh my God, this is like um, a dormitory for seniors. So it, it kind of harkens back to college where they were living you know, communally, but others just you know, one age in place. And, and another challenge, and we're gonna have to get ahead of it sooner rather than later, is that 99% of the technology that's coming down the pike is only gonna allow people to age in, in place in their existing homes even more. You have things like, um, like I said, like Uber. You have like the personal digital assistants that now can read stories of seniors or you can talk to. You have FaceTime and you have all of these things where while you're still alone, you're not as, a, you're not as lonely so those are now what you're going to be selling against is really technology. So that becomes a big challenge. Thank you. Yeah, so I, you know, I agree um, with regards to the need to sell the socialization. And I think um, in independent living, that actually is a huge component of um, our um, message to those independent living residents. And you know, independent living, I also agree with who, whoever on the panel indicated, you know, the acuity level in independent living is getting higher and people are staying in independent living longer and then likewise in, in assisted living. Um, but we have numerous people that move into independent living that really don't need any care, that are, you know, truly independent 
and do so because um, oftentimes they are maybe leaving where they live to move toward um, where their adult child and their family is, but more to be near them than versus needing that extra care. And so for those people, um, all of the things that we've talked about, the location and the amenities and you know um, the things that you can offer them outside of their home is a real selling point. I will be honest that right now in the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> that becomes more challenging. You know, we've had to talk about, you know, some of what we really talk hev most heavily about in our case for support for independent living has been shifted in a big way temporarily. Um, but we are still hearing people say they've been isolated more than ever because of the pandemic. Or, you know, adult children are feeling less comfortable being around their parents or parent. And so where it's become more challenging in one hand, it's also opened an opportunity for us in a way that maybe we wouldn't have expected. And I think, you know, most probably everybody on this call is aware of the numbers, but, you know, 10,000 people a day are turning 65. You know, right now, 50 million people are 65 and over. In the next 50 years, that's going to double to be 100 million. So I think what everybody in this industry is focusing on, it's not either or, it's and, you know, um, because, we, you know, there are going to be people that want to age in their home, and that's great. There's going to be people that you know, want the benefits that a community can provide, either if it's by their own decision in independent living or ultimately needing that care. Um, and so it's really um, making sure that you have a differentiator, both in terms of an industry as an industry, but then also your place within that industry. So you, you mentioned the graffiti wall, Erin. We have, you know, a, a wall in that amenity stack that I talked about for Midtown Park. And it's been um, fashioned after a uh, a graffiti wall somewhere in the south, I think maybe in Atlanta. And, you know, our desire is to bring um, students from various schools. We've been talking with Booker T. We're going to talk with Janie about City Lab, about having some students come and do that art and change that up um, every year or two. Maybe have the residents have some say into, into what they'd like to see. Um, because both, as Grant and Tim mentioned, I can speak as an operator. The residents do want to have a say. They will make their voice heard. The only challenge is, is they don't always agree. So they, you know, then you have to, when you have people feeling strongly on either side, it's hard to um, come to consensus sometimes. Um, but you know, we're looking for ways to bring those generations in. Um, and being in the Jewish community, you know, there's some natural built-in intergenerational that happens just by being a strong affinity. Um, so we have to look for ways to reach beyond our four walls um, and that's been part of our strategic planning, whether that's education for seniors and their families, whether that is um, looking at some adult day um, programming, whether that's for memory support or uh, ways. Right now, we primarily serve only our residents and clients that are served by one of those three operating entities. So we're really looking to expand that. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, we're nearing the end of our time and there's some great questions, um, a lot of which have um, a lot of alignment with sort of my final question, um, which is really around COVID. Um, and so, you know, there's no doubt that this is <laughs> shaking things up um, quite a bit. Um, and um, I think there's real clear, um, at least partial clear understanding of, of some of the downfalls of of you know what what this is causing, um, but I also am hopeful that maybe there's silver linings and maybe that you know as we move forward um, we can envision potentially this as a catalyst for positive change and this time as a catalyst for positive change. And so I'd love to just do a quick sort of round robin where each person could share what's your hope for the future of senior living. What's your hope? that you know this can be a catalyst for positive change. Janie, do you want to start us? Sure. Um, my hope is that we actually turn to our seniors. Um, almost every city has a senior affairs commission and that we actually engage with those people and find out what people want and then figure out how to make it happen. Just that simple. Nice. That's perfect. Grant? My hope is that we'll, we'll avoid the knee-jerk reaction of turning these senior living communities into fortresses, which they have to be during an outbreak, and we all understand that. But I hope that we don't have a knee-jerk reaction and return to an institutional model 
just because of this one outbreak, even though there will be more outbreaks in the future, hopefully smaller, never on this scale again. I still want these, I still hope these communities will stay engaged in their communities and come back into our cities instead of fleeing for the, for the hills and for the suburbs that we can still create energetic, vibrant, urban communities for our seniors to come back. They want to, a lot of them want to come back into the cities. Not everybody, some enjoy that resort style lifestyle, but others want to come back into cities. And I, I also hope that this reinforces the, the idea that small house style care is really important instead of institutional style care. And we're seeing a physical example of right around the corner from me, CC Young, we've talked about it a couple of times. We built in two small house homes per level in a vertical format because they didn't have much land. They're already, none of us could have foreseen the, the advent of the pandemic, but what they're using it for, and, and that was to create some flexibility so that they could change from skilled nursing to memory support, to assisted living, to, to um, hospice care, to rehab as needed all the way through because they knew the demographics over the next few decades will change. What they're using it for now is maximum flexibility to move people around as they start to control, as they control different outbreaks and different concerns and different uh, symptoms. And so it's, it's interesting and I hope senior living will embrace this kind of flexible mentality to be able to not only adapt to future changes, but also adapt to future outbreaks. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I mean, I think of, there's so much around flexibility that we talked about prior, you know, thinking about everything from prefab to, you know, how, how we have long-term flexibility. And I just, I'm glad this is part of a series because I feel like there's so much more to unpack. Um, Tim, do you wanna? Sure, um, it's a great question. I, mine is, is kind of simple. I really hope that we're able to solve the affordability issue. Um, I think it's an ongoing concern. I've been doing this a long time and, and, and you know, it's been a, a challenge. And I, and I think a lot of it is driven by, you know, there's just regulatory requirements around staffing and things that make it hard to kind of reduce the price. Um, so hopefully there'll be, you know, more programs around, you know, Medicaid reimbursement for, for private pay buildings, things like that. But I just feel like we've got to find a way to get, um, more people into the buildings and the only way to do that if they become more affordable. Great answer. <laughs> Melissa, do you wanna? Yeah, I would echo that. I think, you know, with those numbers of seniors that are growing and, and the other statistic that I looked at in preparation for this call was that, you know, um, non-Hispanic whites right now make up 60% in 50 years, it'll be 40%, right? So both in terms of um, as an industry, I hope that we're creative and innovative and flexible in a way that's going to serve a much broader group of those seniors that are going to need um, both, you know, vibrant places to live and ultimately care. And so that's both in terms of being more inclusive in um, the services that we offer and the places that we create so that it's more inviting to a broader group and then also more affordable um, to a broader group. And as Tim mentioned, I think one thing that this pandemic has really, I think, shown a light on that I hope um, we as a country um, recognize is that some of it, it, it does come down to funding. You know, when Medicaid and Medicare and what the insurance companies are doing to our licensed areas for the skilled nursing, it's really hard for people to really run a quality um, service on such low income. I mean, you know, we don't have to be accountants to do the math that you, your revenue has to at least equal your expenses or you're going out of business. And so the, the country needs to focus on getting the right level of funding so that seniors can have the care and services that they deserve. Like slow clap. Um, you guys, it has been such a privilege um, and joy getting to listen to you all. Um, and I have so many pull out quotes and notes. Um, and I just thank you all for your time. Um, and thank you for participating and for sharing your wisdom. Um, look forward to many more discussions in the future. Um, Yuzel, do you wanna close us out? Sure, absolutely. This was absolutely spectacular. Thank you very much, as Erin mentioned, for joining us today and sharing so much information about this phenomenal topic. It was incredibly eye-opening and I still knew a little bit about this and it was quite eye-opening. So thank you to our moderators, our panelists and everybody for joining today. Um, I wanted to share that my one of my big takeaways for the senior living is that 
um, and I've mentioned several times, this is not a one size fits all solution. I love hearing that. Uh, most of this, as Melissa said, is a yes and conversation. And I always, I love sharing that under the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion space. Uh, solutions are very contextual. It's about location, population, the economic needs. It's about people and what they need. As Janie mentioned, which I love too, let's look at who is not at the table. And this is so important in this conversation, particularly when we're making decisions. And of course, as Tim noted, um, how do we solve for affordability? How, how do we really create equity and inclusion in this conversation and have that as the bedrock um, of senior living and the future of our communities? Because it's one and the same for me. So I hope all of you uh, enjoyed learning about the future of senior living. Uh, for those that were not monitoring the chat, um, we have CEU units for all of you. So make sure that you access the link and get your learning units for today. It's 1.5. And please remember, as Aaron mentioned, this is the first of a series. We hope you enjoyed our launch. It will continue next year. And we look forward to bringing you more about design innovation through the lens of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you for elevating the conversation about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion and what it means to create the, the, the future of our communities on our cities. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.